afternoon everyone and welcome to Coffee Chatter. There's not a lot of TV news this week so we'll get right to the long-awaited finale results of Dancing with the Stars. Now that it's almost been a week since the finale, you finally get to hear my review of the night. To kick off the two-hour event, each couple got a five-second mini dance to reintroduce the whole season's cast. Once the show officially started, James and Peta got to re-perform their freestyle as America, not me, voted to see it again, even though they were eliminated the night before from the trophy competition. The team that included Danica during Team Dance Week finally got to perform their dance live, which was awesome. The week they were supposed to perform their team dances, Danica injured her rib, and they had to be judged based on their rehearsal footage from earlier that day which means they did not get to perform it live. Then the three finalists performed their final dances, a fusion dance, where two ballroom styles are chosen to be performed in the same routine. Amy and Derek were up first with an Argentine tango cha-cha mix. This really isn't a challenging fusion because the Argentine tango and the cha-cha have similar movements and quick actions. They had very good transitions, meaning you could easily determine what was a cha-cha and what was an Argentine tango. And they made excellent use of the pauses within the music they were given to aid with their transitioning. They were given a perfect 30. Next came Candace and Mark, which were given a samba quick step mix. This is definitely a more challenging routine as samba is medium paced and sensual, whereas quick step is obviously quick and has a lot of more movements involving the hold position. Despite the trickiness of the performance, they managed to have pretty smooth transitions, but her moves themselves were not as clean as her previous performances. They were given a 27 out of 30. Last to go were Marilyn Max with a Foxtrot Cha-Cha mix. This is another challenging mix for the same reasons as Candace and Mark's. The dancers are on two different ends of the ballroom spectrum. They had really good transitions and were also given a perfect score of 30 out of 30. Now that we've covered the final scores of the season, I'll share the results of this season. In third place was Candace and Mark. Amy and Derek received second place and your Mirrorball champions for season 18, Meryl and Max. While I'm very glad that Derek did not win this season, I can't help but wonder if it's a little rigged, especially since everyone knows Max has never won a season. Also, Meryl looked a little unenthusiastic about winning. She just kind of stood there like, well, there you go, you got your trophy now. Past winners have absolutely gone nuts when they were crowned the winners, enjoying the moment. She just kind of stood there. At any rate, I'm very proud of Candace's accomplishments this season. While she was always the underdog that many people said should have left a long time ago, her fans kept voting her through because she grew each week, both as a dancer and as a woman speaking for Christ and her faith, even having the guts to put her foot down with the costume designers and making sure that there was nothing immodest about her clothing with the exception of Disney Week, where she dressed as Ariel in a two-piece outfit. It's kind of hard to dance to under the sea in character without wearing a mermaid outfit. But even that was not too risky. Our cold case section is once again closer to home in the state of Massachusetts. It was around 11.30 p.m. on August 14, 1985. 32-year-old James Philibert was fatally shot in an apartment he was renovating at 176 Muenau Street in the Dorchester section of Boston. The married father of two succumbed to a wound to his abdomen and the Boston police at the time could not find a motive for the slaying. Robbery has been ruled out because a thousand dollars in his pocket was still there. Another troubling point is that despite a witness hearing gunshots, no perpetrator was seen. Philbert often spent his time working on the apartment, which was only a few streets from where he lived on West Glow Street. Decades later, the case is cold as ice, as a cliche that they use a little too often. However, there are blood relatives of Philbert who have suspects of their own. 
They believe that James Filbert may have known who killed him. If you have any information about this case, please call the Boston Police Department at 617-343-4470. For movie reviews, I've had the chance to watch three movies this past week. The first was The Outsiders. This movie is a classic and includes actors Ralph Macchio and Patrick Swayze, among others. It's based off a novel of the same title and takes place in the 1950s and involves a group of neighborhood children known as the Greasers as they face those who are more well off known as the Soches. It's a poignant movie that reminds us that we're told to love and respect each other regardless of our differences. The next movie I watched was The Conjuring. Those of you who know me well enough know that I'm interested in movies about ghost haunted houses. Not that I'm a die-hard ghost hunter, but just out of pure curiosity and to see how fake or real they come to actually creating a real haunting storyline. This was definitely one of the better movies. It's about the Warren family, a couple and their young daughter, Judy, who purchase a house in which very weird paranormal activity begins to occur. The basis of the movie surrounds a house that came with a very sad story attached to it, and a large family moves into the house and almost instantly paranormal activity starts occurring in great measures. From doors shutting, which lock you into the room momentarily, to nightly visions, cold spots, and the mother even gets possessed by a witch that formerly lived there. The scare factor was definitely there, and it was an interesting movie. The last movie I watched was a movie not very well known that I found on Netflix called House of Voices. This is another haunted movie, although the storyline is much different. This takes place in an orphanage for children. There was also a special section of the orphanage that only the workers knew about, the sanitarium, where the special children were kept. A few of the orphans in the orphanages were being visited by the scary children, which is what the children called the special children, at night. But when they mentioned it to, co to workers, they were automatically labeled as insane and were ignored. An older orphan, who was deemed insane because she had constant battles with the special children visiting her at night, befriended the new assistant, Anna, who was sent to work at the orphanage in an attempt to hide her pregnancy, as she was an unwed mother, something frowned upon in the times this movie took place. The older orphan, whose name was also Judy, and Anna met at night, after Anna started having moments with the special children herself. They find all the information about the special children, and Anna makes the decision to go explore the sanitarium herself, leaving Judy behind. While she's struck in the san stuck in the, in the sanitarium, the time comes for her to have her child, in which the child is delivered by the special children. This is where the fiction factor of this movie comes in, as obviously ghosts do not become totally human and functional. It was an interesting movie with just enough of a spook factor to make me jump in certain spots. I also watched a new or new to me TV show, Last Comic Standing. Although apparently it is not a new show it, as it's had previous seasons, it's new to me as I've never really watched it before. Last Comic Standing is a show similar to that of American Idol, America's Got Talent, Dancing with the Stars, etc., etc only it focuses around comedians. Roseanne Barr from the show Roseanne is one of the judges in which she and two other established comedians judge the acts of those who audition for the show, which is known as the Invitationals. Once they have their slots filled, the show will move on to semi-finals mode in which all the chosen comedians will then come up with a new routine or enhance their original routine with more material to send them through to the finals. The last comic standing gets their own special on NBC and possibly future contracts with other networks. I wanted to watch this show to see if there were any genuine comedians trying out for the show. Genuine as in not fake. They were being themselves and actually funny and not forced or picking on politics as the sole income of their jokes because so many comedians go right to the world issues to choose for jokes and 
you can find jokes in your own life in your own life in your own family you don't need to go right to world issues you know that's for the extremely professional comedians in my opinion there were two so far that I genuinely liked and enjoyed Tracy Ashley and a woman named Dana I look forward to seeing how far they both go in this competition and hope one of them wins Last Comic Standing is on NBC on Thursday nights. I believe it is at 8 p.m. Now for Reflection Corner. Our reading today comes from Acts 16, 22 to 34. The crowd joined in the attack on them, and the magistrates had them stripped and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After inflicting many blows on them, they threw them into prison and instructed the jailer to guard them securely. When he received these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and secured their feet to a stake. About midnight, while Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God as the prisoners listened, there was suddenly such a severe earthquake that the foundations of the jail shook. All the doors flew open and the chains of all were pulled loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, thinking that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted out in a loud voice, do, not harm to your, do no harm to yourself, we are all here. He asked for a light and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you and your household will be saved. So they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to everyone in his house. He took them in at that hour of the night and bathed their wounds. Then he and all his family were baptized at once. He brought them up into his house and provided a meal, and with his household rejoiced at having come to faith in God. Our psalm today is Psalm 138, verses 1 through 3 and 7 and 8. Lord, on the day I called for help, you answered me. I thank you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods to you I sing. I bow low toward your holy temple. I praise your name for your fidelity and love. For you have exalted over all your name and your promise. Lord, on the day I call for help, you answered me. When I cried out, you answered. You strengthened my spirit. Lord, on the day I called for help, you answered me. Though I walk in the midst of dangers, you guard my life when my enemies rage. You stretch out your hand, your right hand saves me. Lord, on the day I call for help, you answered me. The Lord is with me to the end. Lord, your love endures forever. Never forsake the work of your hands. Lord, on the day I called for help, you answered me. Our gospel today is John 16, verses 5 through 11. But now I am going to the one who sent me, and not one of you asks me, where are you going? But because I told you this, grief has filled your hearts. But I tell you the truth, it is better for you that I go. For if I do not go, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
And when he comes, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and condemnation. Sin, because they do not believe in me. Righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will no longer see me. Condemnation, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. While the gospel this week is a little short and leaves you wondering what the beginning of the story is and what happens next, isn't that sort of like life? It's funny how it happened that way. We're born, yet so many things have happened before us that we learn bits and pieces about in history class, but are not given the full picture. The future is the same. We are told to take one day at a time, but in today's world, how is that humanly possible? Our minds automatically start running, wondering where our next meal will come from, how we'll make the bills on time, if we're wasting our time going to school, if there'll be a job in our field when we're done. It's all a big mystery, which ties into our first reading in which a miracle happens in the form of an earthquake and frees the prisoners. The jail guard even thinks of suicide because he feels ashamed that he didn't do his job properly. The scripture did point the fact that he was awoken. But Paul and Silas yell out not to harm himself, for they are all there. They didn't escape the prison, but were just unchained. How many times have you simply thought about suicide, but something changed your mind? Perhaps you had the gun in your hand, or the rope tied to the ceiling, or the pills at the ready, but some still small voice stopped you or the phone rang, or the doorbell. Those are not coincidences, but little whispers from loved ones that it's not your time yet. Or even if you're just having a bad day and something out of the blue happens like that. Take it as a message that everything will be okay. God is there for you to lean on. We only have one saint today, and that is St. Augustine of Canterbury. Augustine of Canterbury is the patron of England. This is not St. Monica's son. He is simply known as St. Augustine. There's a common question about if this is the same Augustine and it is not. Augustine was born during the 6th sixth, sixth century in Rome, Italy. In 596, he was prior at a local monastery when Pope Gregory asked him to lead a mission to convert the Angelo Saxons of southern England. When Augustine and his group reached France, a number of the monks were reluctant to push on, fearing the dangers that lay ahead. Augustine returned to Rome, received encouragement from Gregory, then came back to the monks and convinced them to continue. In 597, the group reached land controlled by the Angelo Saxon King Ethelbert. A pagan, Ethelbert was married to a Christian, and he allowed Augustine to live and preach in his capital of Canterbury. Soon the king agreed to accept Christianity, and by some accounts Augustine baptized thousands of his people. Sometime after 597, Augustine traveled to France to be consecrated as archbishop and then returned to Canterbury to continue strengthening the church in England. Augustine built Canterbury's first cathedral and a monastery he named for St. Peter and St. Paul. By Pope Gregory's order, Augustine did not destroy pagan temples in the region, and he even tried to incorporate some traditional Angelo-Saxon religious rites into Christian ceremonies. The Archbishop also set up sees in London and Rochester. Augustine had less luck with renewing ties between the Roman Church and the Celtic Christians of Wales. He tried to persuade the Welsh to accept Roman rites, but did not succeed. Still, by the time of Augustine's death, around 604, he had established a solid foundation for the Roman Church in England. After Augustine, Archbishops of Canterbury were said to occupy the chair of Augustine and the bishopric was the most important in England. Today, the Archbishop of Canterbury is the leader of the Angelican Church, which split off from the Roman Catholic Church nearly 500 years ago. In the spirit of Augustine, recently, Angelicans and Catholics have tried to overcome their differences 
and find common religious ground. Leading that effort is the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, or ARCIC. The commission was founded in 1970, several years after a meeting between Pope Paul VI and Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael Ramsey. Members of ARCIC have come together to discuss the nature of the Eucharist, rules for ordination, and church authority. The two sides still have differences, but they are committed to continuing their dialogue. Their example reminds us to try to understand people of all faiths. Let us remember this, especially as we journey towards a new church, the Feast of Pentecost, to respect and understand other faiths, even those who choose to not have a faith at all. Our closing prayer. Dear God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you called upon Augustine of Canterbury to teach others how to live better in this world and seek everlasting life in the next. May all who take on missions of salvation share in the saint's devotion, and in our hearts may we know the same certainty he acted on as a servant to your name. Amen. Our fan of the week this week is another constant player, Maurice Isabel. The answer this week was the Apatheid Museum. I will post the question for next week's episode tonight, and it's a new category, which means the questions will be a little bit harder. Before I go this week, I just wanted to plug my class, Faith and Flip Flops, which starts next week, June 3rd, at 6 o'clock at my house. If you're in the area and you'd like to show up and, and learn about the rosary, that's our subject this week coming up. You're more than welcome. Bring a snack to share and hopefully we will see you. If not, I will see you next week for Coffee Chatter. Have a great week.